So today we're honored to have Professor Nesson from Harvard Law School speak to us. And I know he frequently uses poker in his classes there. So I am really excited to find out how. So without further ado, let's get him up. All right, my name's Charlie. All right. At Harvard, I'm professor. Here, I'm just Charlie. <laughs> I teach uh, two courses. One course in evidence, which is how trial works, and a second course called the American Jury, which is, as you might imagine, about the American Jury. Why do I like poker? Why am I interested in poker? What do I use it for? Well, kids come to law school for a variety of reasons. But down at the bottom, with most of them, they come because they feel some passion for justice. I mean, that's what draws them. They see some movie, they're touched by some notion. The idea that there is justice in the world, somehow grounded in a principle of equality amongst human beings, is at the bottom of what brings the kids to school. Now, once they get there, we do our best to take that out of them. <laughs> I mean, after all, the mission of the school is to produce cogs in the machine, is it not? So, for example, if you look at the basic curriculum, you know, what are the basic law courses? What do they really want you to know? The most important things for you to learn. What are the required subjects of the first year? Well, is criminal law. But if you think in terms of what law is about, criminal law has a funny point of view to it. If you start from the idea of what law is about, it takes two forms. There is the natural law, the law of God, it used to be thought, the law of nature, the law of the environment. Larry Lessig's first book, Code is Law. That's natural law. That's not state law. That's the natural law of the digital environment that we now live in. And then there's a second kind of law, positive law. The law that states make, it's made of statutes. And the story of the emergence of positive law, initially seen as a protection of individual liberty, is part of a glorious story of the growth of Anglo-American sensibility of right starts with the Magna Carta. The essence of the Magna Carta is you got a bunch of barons. Here we are. We're the barons. We're all equal. We need to make a state. We need to set up a king because we can see that there are utilities in having a collective government. And yet we also see that the major threat from setting up a king is to our liberty. Our liberty. The most important thing. Live free or die. And so, the idea, the king set up as powerful, may only take our liberty away if 12 of us unanimously agree. Now, that's a profound idea. That's an idea in the architecture of state and individual relationship. The story, as it plays itself out through English history, 
is one of incredible courage by selected folk as the emergence of jury went forward. William Penn, after whom Pennsylvania is named, was one of the great heroes of history, a radical Quaker who believed totally in liberty, a, you know, a thou and all that sort of thing. effectively established the freedom of juries to make decisions about people's liberty and to have it respected. <clears throat> All right, so this, 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 this sense of individualism and <coughs> citizen liberty that is very much at the source of what I teach Now, why poker? Well, before I respond to why poker, I want to ask you if you would take 10 minutes and meet a fellow colleague of mine who teaches trial at Stanford and who was invited to speak to the graduating class at Stanford, and did so in a way that was recorded on YouTube that I'd like to share with you. This will take a few minutes, ten, about, about 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Can we do the lights in some fashion that's better? Yeah, I think. <coughs> my teams, my town shanks, students, Will? Okay, you can. Here, this is a man named George Fisher, professor at Stanford. When I look back at my early years, yeah, we've got to get him up on volume. I see with some regret, though in some cases, that I sometimes lack the courage. I think I yield this I regret one case. Yeah, my first promise. Yeah, so I, I, I think you should just have like this. And this is why I got some years ago. Can you hear that? It's the prosecutor's transcript. All right, let me go back to the beginning here. To superiors or it's somewhat. When I look back in my early years as a Massachusetts prosecutor, I see with regret and some pain that I sometimes lacked the courage and conscience. I sometimes yielded to the contrary commands of my superiors, my pride, or my ambitions. I regret one case, my first homicide prosecution, most of all. Prosecutor's first homicide marks the coming of age. It's the prosecutor's transition from petty case pump to superior court somewhat. Now that first homicide isn't typically a chainsaw massacre. Typically it's an unintentional homicide, often involving a car. The charge in my case was negligent motor vehicle homicide, and that charge meant exactly what it said. All I needed to prove was negligent driving that caused death. I didn't need to prove intent or even recklessness or even gross negligence. Simple negligence would do. But a man had died, and conviction carried serious costs for the defendant, the risk of imprisonment, and the certainty of a 10-year loss of driver's license. The facts were desperately sad. The victim had lived and died unnoticed. He had no job, no known family, no apparent friends. He had only a name and an apartment in an aging, Soviet-style, high-rise public housing park. He was sickly and gray. He walked with a limp and a cane, and he lived behind gray concrete. Even 
to his neighbors, he seemed to strain. Maybe he ventured out only at night. At all events, he died at night. Limping across the busy street that ran along the project, he fell in the middle of the crosswalk. It seems no one saw him fall or knew why he fell, but he was conscious and he knew he was about to die. That much we know because the defendant told police at the scene of the happened. She had been driving at a normal speed, she said, with normal care, but never saw the man until an instant before she hit him. Even then, all she saw was his arm, waving his cane over his head, warning cars he was there. By the time she saw the man's cane, it was far too late to stop. All this she told the police after they arrived on the scene. Then, having answered their questions, she walked to the side of the road, doubled over, and vomited. Her teenage son, who had been riding next to her, looked on. The defendant didn't vomit because she was drunk. The police saw no sign of heavy drinking. They did not charge her with drunk driving. They did not question her account that she drank a single beer while spending the evening with friends. She vomited for a different reason. Because her horror at having killed a man found no expression in words. Those are the facts when the case arrived at my desk. It was a homicide, my first. And I knew I could prove the charge. Cars must yield to pedestrians and crosswalks whether walking or falling down, whether in broad daylight or in pitch darkness. The defendant's own words convicted. Yes, some jurors would resist this result. She suffered enough, they'd say, and there but for God's grace goes any of us. But the judgment structures, they must decide the case of the facts and the law. The facts and the law of compelled conviction. In the end, I felt sure, jurors would agree. Yet I did not want to cross them. I could prove the charge, but those first jurors were right. Any of us, if distracted for a moment, could have hit that man. A police expert who analyzed the scene confirmed that the defendant had been driving at a reasonable speed and the victim was already on the ground when she hit him. And the defendant had shown the courage to stop, wait for the had she simply driven off, sworn her son to silence, and gone home to bed, none would have been the wise. Yes, she had been killed. She killed a man. But she intended no harm and showed great remorse. She posed no likely danger to anyone else. Yet the consequences of conviction could be severe. A 10-year loss of her license could trigger loss of her job and land her son on the street. With a homicide on her record, she might never find another job. So I approached the head of our homicide unit, my superior on the case, and explained why I thought we should not press for a conviction. Massachusetts law allowed a middle ground. The judge could defer sentence for a year and compel the defendant to attend a safe driving program and complete community service and not to drive except for at the end of the year, if she complied with the court's conditions, the judge could dismiss the charge. To me, this result seemed proportionate to the defendant's wrongdoing. But the homicide chief was a hard man to me. He was a prosecutor to the court, brother to one prosecutor, husband to another. He and his wife shared two state salaries and an old station wagon and scrimped to raise their kids. They had sacrificed a lot to serve the public, and I admired him for that. But he had a chilling lust to win and a contempt for the accused that I could not admire or share. The Supreme Court wrote in 1935, a prosecutor's first ethical duty is not to win the case, but to see that justice is done. He told me I should try that case and demand a conviction. Weeks later, with the case near trial, I met with the homicide chief again. I was
was prepared for trial, he could not see the justice pressing for a conviction. He never budged. He was either unmoved by my arguments or unwilling ever to show lenience, however well justified leniency. And so I had a decision to make. I could stand with my conscience and withdraw from the case, or I could cave to his command. There were good arguments for Kate. The homicide chief had far more experience. Maybe he knew something I did not. Maybe he saw through the defendant's remorseful facade. Maybe. But I did not think so. I believed he simply knew no other course but win. And yet I came. I took that case to trial. Looking back today, I can see the pressures I faced. Had I withdrawn from the case, another prosecutor would have stepped in, angry at being handed my work. The homicide chief would remember my challenge to his authority. He would resent the suggestion that my ethical standards were higher than his. Worse, he would think me a win, lacking the backbone for the tough cases. My stature in the office was at risk. I had no desire to spend my career behind a beat-up steel desk in the basement office trying petty cases at the outlying district court where I started my career. I wanted to be downtown in Superior Court trying cases that counted. So I took that case to trial. To my good fortune, I lost. My problem was not the facts or the law for both of them on my side. My problem was the fundamental injustice of conviction of those facts. Others could see that injustice as clearly as I can. Others had the courage to act on it. That was decades ago. Yet I still look back on my choice with regret. It was a failure of conscience, a failure of the courage to do right as I saw the right. Not long after you walk out our doors, you will face pressures like those I faced. Pressures to please your boss or client. Pressures to succeed and burnish your pride. Sometimes those pressures will accord with your conscience and with the governing rules of ethics. When they do not, take a pause. Set aside the pressures of then walk ten steps down the road and look back on your shoulders. Don't leave yourself wondering, as I do, why your courage won't want to be. So tell me. decision by prosecuting that case. Let me see a show of hands. And how many of you think he made the right decision by prosecuting that case? Show of hands. Let's just see. If he stands up to the boss and says, I must act on my conscience. It is unjust and I refuse to do it. I refuse to be a cog in the machine. What happens? Well, he was pretty good at articulating what happens. He stays in the basement office out in the outlying district, and after a while he gives up and becomes a law professor. <laughs> what happens if he prosecutes? Did anything bad, in fact, happen? 
In fact, he got just the result he wanted, did he not? In fact, is the lesson here that he's preaching to the Stanford students that you should always stand up for your conscience? Or is the lesson that when you find yourself in a tough spot where you're pressed to play by the rules and yet you can see that at least one way to play it produces injustice, that you can play it another way and produce justice. He won by losing. He honored the rules. He satisfied his boss. The only thing he did wrong was feel bad about it and then preach to a bunch of Stanford students that they should do some hearts and flowers way of going through life. So, poker. Why poker? Because the first lesson that you must learn in poker, the game teaches you that you are a player in the game. That's it. For these kids that I teach, who face the problem of going off and being a cog in the machine, bad lesson. You don't have to give up your commitment of justice just because you play by the rules of the game. You just have to play for what you want. There, we just witnessed a crime. It just took place. The question is, which hand did Nesson put the chalk in? How will we decide this? Well, you could decide it by prying my hands open. But that's not the way we do it in law. In law, we take matters which have breached the peace, which have caused tumult, because people can't agree on what happened. And then we resolve the tumult by charging someone with the crime, and then prosecuting them by this remarkable rhetorical performance where we call witnesses for live testimony before a jury of his peers. You recognize right away that none of you could be jurors to this crime. Do you know why? Because you're not ignorant. You're witnesses. You know something about which hand it's in. You're all disqualified from being jurors. So now how do we do this trial? <laughs> we do it by an adversary process. We have a lawyer for the left hand, and we have a lawyer for the right hand. <clears throat> the lawyer for the left hand calls witnesses. Do we have any witnesses here who saw it? Left hand. Left hand. Left hand? <laughs> yes. <laughs> State your name, please. <laughs> you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Were you present in room, whatever it is, 276 of this Sloan management building, impossible to find? In <laughs> and did you see which hand Nesson put the chalk in? Which hand did he put the chalk in? 
<laughs> Speak up. Was it the, uh... <laughs> Boy, are you a lousy witness. <laughs> Come on, build it up. The left hand. The left hand. Your witness. <laughs> And then the right-hand lawyer gets up and crosses the examiner. You weren't really paying attention, were you? You were, yeah, no, you were sitting way over the side of the room. How else could it be that you, yes, exactly. And then you know how it goes. We'll call somebody for the right hand, and maybe we'll call three or four since there are lots of you. And then when we get finished, the judge tells a bunch of people who know nothing about it that they will be locked into a room and kept there until they decide which hand it was in. Now, here's the lesson. It's a tough lesson for lawyers to learn, young lawyers. It's the key. As far as the law is concerned, as far as the judge is concerned, as far as we students are concerned, It doesn't matter which hand the chalk is in. It doesn't matter because you can never go back and see. It's lost in time. The accident that happened at the corner happened in a moment, an instant in time. It's gone. This fist is like Schrodinger's cat. I tell you, you were at MIT, you'll do quantum <coughs> proof. The reality of which hand the chalk is in does not exist. Until the verdict. Before the jury speaks, Schrodinger's cat is alive or dead, we do not know. It's remarkably like the two hole cards that you're facing. You don't know what they are. They are uncertain from your point of view. You don't resolve that uncertainty until you break the box by paying to see them. Up to that point, they're like, they're like something multiplied by the square root of minus one. It's something, but it doesn't quite exist. All right, so this idea of dealing with uncertainty and thinking about it in poker terms has utility for lawyers. If you think in poker terms, the uncertainty of that process becomes its chief attribute the secrecy of the jury, the idea that, well, the jurors know what hand to did, but we don't ever hear the jurors say anything but the verdict. The idea that jurors are assembled out of anonymous population come together for just this one event <clears throat> and decide it and then dissipate so that the jury gets to function like an oracle. It speaks its wisdom and then it's gone. And the rules of law shield that jury secrecy aggressively. It's like the law understands the idea of Schrodinger's cat. You can't break into the box. The first case we study, this will bother you, I'm sure. Two guys convicted in a federal court. There, it's fraud, it's a money thing. After the conviction, their lawyer comes forward with affidavits that he's gotten from the jurors. 
Took him a while, it's like a month after the trial. But he's got juror affidavits to the effect that during the trial, during the lunch hours, people were drinking quite considerably, smoking grass and snorting cocaine. That there were even occasions when drugs were being passed around in the jury box. And so juror affidavits to the effect that the jury was flying. And the defendant comes to court and says, I am entitled to a new trial. I certainly am entitled to a competent jury, and a competent jury means one that's not loaded on cocaine. And that case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Here, you decide. Is he entitled to a new trial or not? How many say yes? How many say no? You're all you just one person in the left hand, that's all the only one that cut it was you. <clears throat> Two people understand that you can't break into the jury. You can't have the jurors talking about what went on in the jury room. If you do that, you're going to break the oracle. It doesn't work. If you do that, as soon as the guilty verdict comes in, and the guy with the money who just got convicted says, what do we do next? The answer will be, we go interview all the jurors and bug them until one comes forward and says they were flying. So, let me change gears with you. That's a, a, a sense of how I used poker in at least the way I approach law and teach law. But I'm also very much engaged with poker as a matter of, of, of learning and <clears throat> for my own self <coughs> and mo <coughs> excuse me, I'm just getting over the cold. <coughs> Here, take a minute, you talk. Found somebody comment on what I've said. If I stimulated you in some way, give me a break. <coughs> yes. Um what happens if like one of the jurors who did not participate in passing around the grass, like saw and like couldn't control like she or he like felt conscious and guilty that there was something going on inside the jury box. In that case, like how is is that considered like breaking the oracle if the juror speaks up? Up until the time that the verdict is delivered, if a juror complains, <clears throat> we'll look into it, see if there's a problem. As soon as you got the verdict, it closes. The jury <laughs> dissipates, we don't want to hear from them again. The way the line gets drawn, if a juror is influenced by outside influences, you can examine it and go back and... So if somebody bribed a juror from outside and you can prove it by a witness other than the jurors, you're okay. But if what you're trying to prove has to do with something that's interior to the jury space and interior to the jurors so that the only way to prove it would be through juror testimony that you can't do so the, the actual bar is against jurors testifying as to what went on in reaching a verdict okay so uh, I am uh, the a uh, principal investigator at Harvard uh, of a project of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, which is an organization I founded with Jonathan Zittram back some years ago. The project entitled the Mind Sport Research Network. It's 
premised on the idea that mind sports, of which I consider to be poker, to be the quintessential American mind sport, but the category inclusive of chess and backgammon and really any kind of game, competitive game of skill played with the mind. Uh, the idea is that, and the thing we're most interested in, is the way in which the learning to play mind sports relates to the development of mathematical intelligence. And we're specifically interested in it in a negative way. Uh, I have done work in the island of Jamaica. Let's see. Jamaica is a very interesting place for me. It's um, when we started the Berkman Center, we asked the question, uh, will the internet be of use to a developing nation? Where, where could we go to experiment with that? And uh, Jamaica was very attractive to us. Jamaica, as many of you probably know, is a tremendously warm, charismatic place. Uh, seat of reggae and amazing runners. Uh, if you think in internet terms, in which you take as the predicate of the environment that anyone can go anywhere, you just have to know where you want to go. Jamaica as a brand has so much more power to it than the size of the island would indicate that it's, it's curiosity that they've not succeeded in benefiting more from their extraordinary status in the world. So there's a real developmental issue. And so here's the strategy that we've embarked on. I first began very high on the idea of introducing poker in schools. It turns out it's a tough sell. <laughs> it's especially a tough sell as you get down from high school to high school, primary school. It's like parents are worried about the kids gambling. And so the idea of somehow breaking poker into schools just is an uphill battle. On the other hand, chess is like a golden Cadillac. Everybody loves it. Everybody thinks that their kids playing chess is excellent. People seem to understand that the idea of learning to command a sequential line of inference is a valuable intellectual tool. So we've actually come over the years to a strategy of chess in school as our lead. But the problem with introducing chess in schools in a place like Jamaica is where does the money come from to support the person to travel and teach the kids chess? And the fact is, there's no money. And the first rule that we worked with and have worked with scrupulously, is that when coming to Jamaica, we don't come with money. That's not it. And so what we've evolved is a strategy of community support for chess in schools by the play of community <coughs> games of chance, including poker. Play nights for adults with food and drink and gambling, where tournaments are played on a 50-50 basis. Half your entry fee goes for the prize pool, half goes for chess in school. And then the strategy of this is to engage the surrounding community of teachers and parents in the play of games themselves as a way of working against a very considerable math aversiveness. In Jamaica, for example, less than 20% of kids pass 
the sixth grade math achievement test. And the reason is that the teachers who are teaching the kids in the primary schools are very substantially math aversive themselves. They don't like math, they don't teach it. And as soon as you approach that problem by thinking you're going to change the teachers to new ones, you hit the problem that there aren't any new teachers. You're going to work with these teachers. And as soon as you approach the problem with these teachers by telling them how to teach math better, you get the glaze come over their eyes instantly. It's like math aversion. They're not going to listen. But the strategy of approaching from the side with community games as a way of supporting chess in school and just getting the teachers into playing games, that makes a ton of sense. And poker is just a marvelous game to look to as a potential revenue source to support other mind sports. So that's a big thrust at the moment. Now, when I go to Jamaica with this program, the guy I lead with, my partner in this, I understand you had a champion chess player here last year, I mean last week. My partner is here, I'll take two minutes and I'll allow him to teach you the secret of chess. Okay, <laughs> the first example is going to be very, very simple. This is just to get it started. This, this is Maurice Ashley. He is the first black <clears throat> chess grandmaster. Jamaican. You see many more complicated examples as we go along, but right now I just want to show you how easy it is, how simple it is to do this idea that I'm talking about that I call the secret to chess. All right, let's take a look at the position you see here. White played the move knight to f5. A little bit of a funky move. The move obviously uh, hangs a knight, at least it looks like it hangs a knight, but you can't quite capture this knight because then the knight on e8 is hanging and the attack uh, probably ends in, in something nasty after something like this. Uh, big advantage of white. All right. Let's go back. Knight to f5 was played. So Black, realizing that he didn't want to trade, decided to make a different move. Play the move b3. Now this move is a howler. Instantaneous death. Now, many of you might just see the move, like the winning move is. You can see I, I have the move here. But the point I want you to recognize, the main point I'm trying to make, and you'll see from this basic example, uh, but you'll see it in all the examples, is that the reason the move is bad is because it has a significant drawback. It stopped defending a square that it once defended. Now, in chess, every single move is like this. Every move you make in chess, no matter what move it is, must stop defending squares that the piece used to defend before it moved. That's just a reality. There's no way to escape from here. So what I like to do, whenever a person makes a move, the first thing is to say, to ask myself the question, what squares are no longer defended by that last move? Basic question. If you look at this position, the answer is pretty clear. C3 and A3. Once those two squares light up in your mind, the right move is just right there. Queen to A3 check. After this, the game is simply over. Move king to g8 was played, rook g3 check, and after king move to h8, queen to f8 check, game over. Black resign. Very simple example. I know the move b3 queen was a bad one. Queen a3 is not so hard to find, but it shows exactly the idea that I'm trying to show in this video and that you will see as we continue. So bear with me because the examples will get a lot more interesting. But keep in mind the key question, what squares are no longer defending? Once you have that, you have the secret chess. <clears throat> so I know you're all aware of the MIT, Harvard, edX, venture. And from the vantage of the Berkman Center, 
this challenge of global education, of course, is fairly central. And the methodology that is most featured at the moment is of these massive courses where the relationship is directly between the teacher and someone sitting at a screen. I'm embarked with my colleague at the Berkman Center, Terry Fisher, in a different model. Terry is teaching copyright as a Harvard edX class, and the model is one of teaching it through teaching assistants in satellite locations. And what you see here is a little article about uh, the Jamaica satellite of Terry Fisher's copyright class. Being led by one of my former students who graduated, went to New York, practiced intellectual property law for seven years, then married someone in Kingston, and is now leading a satellite group, which she has put together by invitation of remarkable people in Jamaica who are interested in the question of how Jamaica can profit from its brand in the global intellectual property world. We're doing it in a template that seems rep rep excuse me, reproducible and scalable, so that the vision is of a central course being offered out of harbor by Terry, completely free, <coughs> completely open, with satellites formed with former students and others who want to be leading groups, but in the various nations of the world intellectual property environment, in such a way that allows a course which puts out an American base of law, but then takes in reaction from all around the globe. We think that that's a model that's reproducible from other places, and we're joining with centers in other parts of the world to proceed on a similar basis. And the idea is that whereas the massive courses seem to many teachers and many existing institutions as quite threatening, just bypassing them, you know, straight from big institution to student, this is a model that really invites participation by existing institutions who have existing teacher structures. So the vision at its broadest is of a cyber world. I actually started out with the founding of the Berkman Center, taking on the kind of fanciful name of Eon, Dean of Cyberspace. But the vision was of a cyber curriculum of an educational world that was built on open values, combining the ideals of education and sport. And by sport, very much inclusive of my sport. And the model that we're at work on is one that has Jamaica as the focal point for pilot templates in both the educational environment and the mind sport environment. And the hope is that if we can succeed with both of those, that we're in position then to move to UNESCO and WIPO and the global organizations of sport and intellectual property in a way that invites participation. Our specific objective is to persuade UNESCO 
to sponsor a global mind sport play day where mind sports are played in schools and libraries uh, throughout the UNESCO nations. Uh, on February 12th, there's actually going to be a community <coughs> mind sport benefit evening at our pilot program in Jamaica. And if uh, Will will cooperate, I would be delighted to invite all of you to engage in online poker with a group on February 12th uh, in Jamaica for the benefit of the chess program there at the school. Uh, Any questions? What time is it? <laughs> well, I think it'll be about seven o'clock in the evening on February twelfth. Cool. All right, so that's my spiel to you guys. That's um, how I use poker, how I think about it. I I I believe let me just let me just put it a close on it. This idea that you're a player in the game. All right, what's the game? The game, from a lawyer's point of view, is rhetorical poker. You're dealing with uncertainty. You are sizing up the moves that you have and the resources that you have, and you are making your move, but at base, the feeling is, it's my move. And the game that you choose to play can be a small game or a very big game. I am tremendously enthused that Harvard has joined MIT in getting into this global education game. But actually working out how we play it, that still <coughs> remains to be seen. And if one can make a connection to the idea that, well, to put it in terms of my students who come to school with a sense of justice, that in their professional training they have no reason to give it up and no license to think that just because they become a professional person that they should somehow dispense with it, quite the contrary. What they become professional about is how to express their sense of justice within the structure. If you go back to the piece with George, there were two things that should have stood out. One is his mention that the Supreme Court says it's the prosecutor's duty to do justice, not to win. Well, that's a profound idea, that we don't always win by winning. That you can win by losing and feel very much in control of your play. The second is the assumption that the jurors are cogs in a machine. The assumption that it's the jury's duty simply to find the fact that it's not the jury's function to do justice. That assumption, which George actually just buys in the way he describes the problem, is true. That is the way the law articulates. Jurors have been disempowered. Jurors are instructed. Jurors started out as the ultimate authority, just as you could imagine if we were the constitutional founders and we decided that a jury of us would control our liberty, and that jury has been reduced in its power to a subsidiary function within the judiciary as a fact finder, 
of whether statutes have been violated or not. But the very idea that the state could take your liberty away just by finding some statute that you violated, where's the justice in that? We would still be drinking British tea. All right, so thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you.